I'm your host, Sukian Lee. Waking up, or I should say getting up on a good Friday after a fitful night of insomnia. Because last night I was hanging out in a 24-hour donut yeah, shop on College and Mathers oh with my good <laughs> pals Joe and Chester, and we were arm wrestling and playing hearts and goofing around. Oh my god! And drinking too much coffee, and I couldn't get any sleep at all last night. But welcome to the new show, and I would like to welcome you to my humble abode. I used to live in Vancouver in a turn-of-the-century row house in Chinatown. The floor sloped at 130 degree angles and the interactive toilet never flushed unless the tank was manually filled with a hose running from the bathtub. Rent was cheap. Three floors for $400 a month. In my neighborhood, it was just like living in the country in the middle of the city. Every morning when I looked out my window, this is what I saw. One day I got a call from Much Music bigwigs Moses Neimer and Denise Donlan. They were familiar with my work as a musician and filmmaker. There was a job opening for an on-air personality and they wanted me to audition. On the fly, I pieced together a segment called Wigs and Guns using my wig and squirt gun collections, then sent it off. A week later, they phoned me back offering the position. Now I live in Toronto. Every morning when I look out my window, this is what I see. Rent is $850 a month, and my toilet flushes. I live here with Oscar and Hannah and my pal Chester Brown, who refuses to be videotaped. The fact is, human beings are incredibly adaptable. That's how bands can cram five people into a van with all their gear and tour across Canada. When I first moved to Toronto, it was a culture shock. You see, I have this theory about subways and skyscrapers. Now, subways, even though they're an efficient means of transportation, they usher people through the intestines of the city and impose this tunnel vision so that people do not have to connect. And skyscrapers, they're so huge and gigantic in size, they seem to squash everything else down and contribute to that terrible shrinking sensation. Winter was painfully cold. Every day after work, I'd go down to the mall and hang out for a sense of community. I felt like one of those zombies in the movie The Dawn of the Dead. I guess it was moving to a new city and getting used to the new job at Much Music that sent my stress level like <laughs> right through my brain. I started hearing voices in my left ear. They were very concise and they would say, Suk yin, suk yin. Well, summer's approaching with warmer weather. I'm getting used to the stress. I stopped hearing the voices, and like I said, humans are adaptable. One day while leaving for work, I opened my front door and found this. If there's one thing I love, it's when traffic's at a standstill because of too many people on the streets. There's something illicit about it, like the time a kid pulled a fire alarm at school and everyone had to go outside and stand on the curb in the rain until the fire truck came. Anyway, I managed to stop some people and ask them what was going on. This is a Juno 6, right? The 6th uh, birthday. Yeah, it's a uh, birthday of our religion. A man gave me a pamphlet. Can I have one too? Sure. Thank you very much. So anyway, the leaflet there will give you a quick explanation Great. of what's going on. It's called Basaki Day. 296 years ago, in 1699, Sri Guru Gobind Singh created the Khalsa, a nation of Sikh men and women bound by a common belief, identity and discipline, the birth of the Sikh religion. Basaki is celebrated by Sikhs around the world. It also coincides around Easter, the Christian holiday celebrating Jesus' crucifixion and ascension into heaven, the Jewish Passover that celebrates the liberation of the Jewish slaves from Egypt, and the pagan Ukrainian painting of Easter eggs symbolizing fertility and rebirth. It's no coincidence that all these religious holidays fall around the same time. As I was walking to work, I passed by a restaurant patio full of empty chairs that somehow reminded me of the parade I had just seen. Empty chairs waiting for someone to sit on them. This is where I work, the Shum City building at the corner of Queen and John in Toronto. I'm a VJ. Tatonga means buffalo in Lakota. What bugs you about this? Well, new what is it? It's just 
a, a stereotype or a kind of a cartoon, a cartoon of what pe people think it was. Public perception believes that much music is an unrelentless, well-oiled machine, when in reality, much music is a microcosm of chaos that somehow, miraculously and relatively seamlessly, hits the television screen. Believe it! J-M-H-S! Yeah! yeah! Eyeball Theater! There's so many things I want to do. Feature good music, short independent films, people, places, things. But most of all, I want to try and capture a sense of reality. It's hard to be real when you've got a camera pointed at your face. Grade three smile. Grade three smile. I want to get, I love it I didn't move a rope. On my way to see the band Helium play, I accidentally left the camera running with the lens cap on. What you're hearing now is the sound of my feet marching toward the club. So far, this is the most genuine moment I've captured on videotape. Helium's a trio from Cambridge, Massachusetts, made up of Mary Timoney, Sean Devlin, and his brother Brian. They drove up from the States, got past the border, and are touring by van. No roadie, no manager. Like an angel of the apocalypse, Mary Timoney, marble-eyed, flat-voiced and resigned, writes songs about boredom, Levi's, and a guitar that spits out baby's bones. The songs start out, like, in some remote place, they start out as what you call pop songs, but then, like, um, playing them in a band setting, like, something about that makes it more aggressive and makes there be weirder noises and stuff. I don't know. <laughs> I say that I'm a feminist, like, they make me out to be this kind of freak or something, freak? and like, yeah, like, they're like, oh, Mary, she's so angry, and like, and then like, there have been so many interviews that have, I mean, not a lot, but at least three that have been really bad like this, that have been like, treating me like I'm this like, weird, angry woman, it's and it's just like, it makes me seem like more of a victim, and like, now I'm just like, I don't know if I should even talk about it. I just want to be a free person be able to do what I want to do and um, encourage other women to play music and um, or not just play music but to do what they want and to not be f***ed over by other people or to not and just I mean I think it's for, important for women to encourage each other to, to do to speak you know and to have a voice and to do what they want. Related to that whole like idea of like oppressed people becoming violent towards their oppressors, and not because I would actually in my real life, but I feel like in my head or something that that's the way that I find some kind of freedom from from it. I, I definitely wouldn't like go out and buy a machine gun and start shooting anyone at all, and I, I don't think that I really could support that in real life. But I understand the, where it comes from in the human mind. Helpful hint number one. I get up at 6 o'clock in the morning. I got Why? I had to be. Why did you get up at 6 in the morning? Because that's my hobby, getting up to 6. Holy Toledo, did you go to breakfast television? Yeah. Woo! Did you get a sub? Yeah, I, I like bre I eat breakfast early in the morning. I never eat breakfast. I do. I know, it makes your day feel like way better if you eat breakfast. Yeah. I go crazy if I don't eat breakfast, but then I always forget to eat breakfast. Yeah, I gotta eat breakfast. Yeah. There you go, I. Okay. Eat breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> breakfast is a good meal. What do you eat breakfast? Chills. My dad. Yeah. Wow. My, my dad says that, that I should eat bran in the morning. Yeah. All Cheerios bran. is very good in the mornings. Okay. Well, I'm gonna try. Yeah. I'm gonna try to remember. Sometimes I forget that I don't have enough time to eat. Yeah. Just take a glass of juice. Yeah. And some breakfast. Okay. Here we are in the beautiful 
Polson Park, where you can see the most scenic view of Toronto. <laughs> We're with members of the Don Spencer Blues Explosion. What do you say, John? Shall we try to find out what people are doing here in the parking lot? Okay, let's run over there. Go! <laughs> so are you just looking at the skyline? Oh uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's a nice skyline here in Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Ask them what kind your favorite donut is. Hawaiian. Hawaiian? <laughs> What's your favorite donut? Liar, Tell us something man. about Tim Horton. Tim Horton? Yeah, he used to play He's hockey for the Leafs. <laughs> you guys are having a party. Sex crazed, <laughs> no! drug infested, <laughs> coke ridden mess. The John Spencer Blues explosion. What? what? Is that alternative music? You want to get high, so high. We want to get high, so high. We want to get high, so high. So what is it the blues gives you? Holy shit, what is that? Holy shit! Whoa! Get it, get it, get it! Holy shit! Oh my god! <laughs> oh, what was that? That had to be like a firework or something. That was a comet. Oh, no, no, no. No, too close that for was, a comet. That was Skylab, man. That was fucking Skylab. Fucking you up, boss! Let's get it! Good evening. What a light show. A fireball blazing across the night sky. It's 12.32 a.m. and a once-in-a-lifetime sighting of a fireball, a huge meteor. This has to be just about the best video that has ever been shot on such a fireball. It was really close to the ground, you could tell, because within seconds, the treetops and the houses were starting to uh, obstruct the view of it. But then within minutes, we had a uh, fire in the uh, south end of the city, and uh, we had witnesses that actually saw the object come from the sky and hit this abandoned trailer that burst in flames. Oh, get it, get it, get it! Basically, it looked almost like a meteorite, sort of like watching Halley's Comet going across the sky. And all of a sudden, the sky just completely lit up. Lights that cascaded. Where were you? I was on top of the van. I had just had a half dozen Hawaiian donuts. I saw a great light flash in the sky. It was this, as if I saw the face of Tim Horton illuminated above the Toronto skyline. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, I got to go. No, I'm all, I'm all messed up. I, I can't. I got I'm, I'm sorry, dude. I'm sorry, and I got to go, honey. I'm sorry. I, Bruce Le Pen is a rat. Bruce Le Pen, the dope. For crab lice, call Bruce Le Pen. Sleeping. One, I keep wondering if I've fallen asleep. Two, I pretend to talk to myself. Three, it's been far too long. Four, one day I hope to wake up. These are some of the scout badges I earned between the years of 1996 and 1992. The drama badge, music, cooking, man of letters, which is a more literary related badge, 11 service bars, one silver chain, the link badge, and the Kim badge. I've been having really boring dreams, like I'll dream that I'm walking down the street or that somebody comes over to my house and we sit around. There's a disease that handicaps one out of every five or so chickens. They call it the creeper chicken. I should have worn my other shoes. I'm really starting to get the hang of that ice dispenser at Subway. Food is expensive.
human being, we are like sponges. We are sponges for information. And this particular summer has been very eventful for me. I've learned a lot. Right now, I'd like to share with you things I learned this summer. Lava lamps do not contain lava. Skin is a human organ. The opposite of composition is decomposition. Of course, I already knew that, but it's kind of strange when you really think about it. The 20th, 20th century corpse is so full of preservatives that now it takes more time to decompose than ever before. Neo Citrin is manufactured by Sandoz Incorporated, the same company that originally developed LSD. Some of the most interesting books have the ugliest covers. Miracle in the Void. Behold, a pale horse. Popular alienation. Kooks, a guide to the outer limits of human belief. Angry women in rock. According to journalist Derek Johnson, in a recent interview in the British celebrity magazine OK, Derek Johnson, who says he was a close pal of Elvis, said that Elvis once confessed to him that he ran over a pedestrian and left the scene of the crime. I killed a man once. It was when I was in my teens. I was driving a truck at night along a dark country road. I hit this guy. He appeared from nowhere. I couldn't stop. I saw right away he was dead and I was nearly sick on the spot. I got back in the cab and drove off. I panicked, I guess. It's haunted me ever since. Bicycles are beautiful and fun to ride. Walking's too slow and it's dangerous at night, while driving disconnects me from the outside world and makes me feel as if I'm watching a movie through the front windshield. Riding a bike is neither too fast nor too slow. It's just me. I have been riding a bicycle for so long, I've become part bicycle. A bike borg! You see, riding along the scenic route through back alley streets is the only way to travel. Plus, riding a bike is free. So one day I'm on my bike heading down the street when I stumble upon a horrible sight. The broken frame of a bicycle chained to a pole. Bent out of shape, it protrudes from the sidewalk. I am left to wonder, what happened? Who left that bike there and why? Did they forget where they parked it? Did they outgrow and abandon it? Did they die and leave it behind? Did they lock it and lose the key? Gradually, I start to notice them everywhere throughout the city, missing body parts like skeletons chained to the stake. How could a bicycle once so vital and useful meet such an awful demise? So, Matt, I ride my bike around, and I see all these Mm -hmm. bicycles that are left on the street locked up yeah. and they're left there forever. Yeah, yeah. Why do you think that is? Well, a lot of these, some are stolen mm -hmm. and, and the what they do is uh, uh, the thief puts his own lock on the damn thing so the original owner can't take it off. How are you, how you going to take it off? Yeah. You know? huh. Too much trouble, you see? You see what I mean? Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> I never even thought of that before. Any other, any other idea? Well, I didn't, didn't, uh, a lot of it's garbage, so somebody uh, was going to fix it. Then he decided he uh, here with it and just left it there and left town or something. So it's left on the street. <laughs> <laughs> you know, lots of people are funny that way. <laughs> <laughs> they must have leave it on the street than anywhere else. <laughs> Fragrance of silver, fragrance of salt, fragrance of silver, fragrance of salt is fragrance of silver, fragrance of salt is fragrance of silver. I full of autumn fragrance I deliver into clouds hanging about in this lit level phosphorescence. Spirit meaning with thine spirit essence it is. Translucence to multicolored radiance, shading the fading from gold into brilliance. Shading the fading from gold into brilliance. Shading the fading from gold into brilliance. And 
Elle nourrit l'amour, c'est ancien comme un volcan, c'est très éloquent. Toujours le survivant dernière, j'aime les journées longues avec ta langue placée là, si charmant comme un triangle mouillé. J'aime les journées longues avec ta langue placée là, si charmant comme un triangle mouillé. Alors avec l'endurance, je veux que tu seras enfouillé. Alors enracine-toi, alors enracine-toi, alors enracine-toi, alors enracine-toi. Okay, what's your name? I'm Jada. Grada? Oh, Jada. <laughs> Jada. Jada, like Dada. Dada, Jada. Yeah. So, what do you, what's your style? Oh, I, I don't know. I'm still trying to figure it out. <laughs> but uh, I like I like clothes that match with my food. It's good stuff. <laughs> I like eating Sundays on cold days. <laughs> I like to speak very directly and encourage people and say women should get on stage and talk about things that are important to them and play music and not always feel that they can't because they're that's what their boyfriends the do. Power and, to somebody yeah, else, yeah. And, and it is very powerful, mm -hmm. you know, to get on stage and, and to express yourself, mm -hmm. ma'am. You know, in, in this world, uh, it's, it seems that we've lost a lot of political rights, a lot of, you know, there's a, a ch change to the right and a lot of socialistic ideas, anarchistic ideas that people have embraced this century have run their course, and it's a question of coming up with new ideas. So I think people have lost their political rights, replaced by consumer rights now, and even I think that is in danger. Do you like shopping? <laughs> wow, wow, what a swing. I love to shop. Yeah, I love shopping too. Yes. What's your favorite thing to shop for? Uh, trial size uh, products. Anything, a dollar store things. I guess I like uh, socks and shirts and shoes. My favorite thing to shop for is food at the supermarket. Ah. When some of us couldn't stand up, some of us couldn't stand up, some of us couldn't be bothered to stand up, and the word that it was in the army. Our level of expectations keeps going down. Mm -hmm. We expect television to be bad. We expect the radio to be bad. Mm -hmm. We expect movies to be bad. So, you know, where are we fighting back? Do, do you watch TV, there? Uh, yeah. Yeah? I find it very relaxing because uh, I, uh, I think about other things. So I turn on the hockey game and, uh, and then I, I come up with all these good songs. I like all the crappy talk show things like oh, yeah. Oprah and Jenny. Jerry Springer? Anything like that. Yeah, if I do too. It's a good you know, something to do with something awful that's gone wrong in somebody's household. I want to know the inside scoop. In many ways, I think what, what Jean, Peter, and I are trying mm -hmm. to do is maintain a uniqueness outside of the industry standard. Mm -hmm. And that is an incredible battle when you try to do what you want to do, basically, mm -hmm. which I, I always think is the and essence of life. And that's sort of, of an anarchistic notion, too, to just do what, yeah. what you want. Yeah, but, you know, with res respect to other people and respect to yourself, you know, as opposed to a, a totally nihilistic viewpoint. I was wondering, why do you ride a horse? It's my job. For, but don't you ride a motorcycle and sometimes a police car? Uh, not anymore. The last 12 years, I've ridden a horse. Always on a horse, hey? That's right. Isn't it a bit cumbersome to apprehend a person? Well, we all have different duties. Uh-huh. So would you like like chase somebody down on a horse in the middle of Toronto? You think? If I felt it was necessary, yes. Have you ever had to do that? Uh, no, I haven't. Wow, so usually it's like uh, traffic and stuff Tra like that? Crowd tra control, traffic direction. Do you like riding a horse better than a motorcycle or a car? Yes, I do. How come? I enjoy, enjoy the camaraderie with the horse. <laughs> so he's your bud? Uh, more or less, yes. What's his name? His name is Billy. Hi, Billy. Hey, Billy. <laughs> Thank you, Chief. Very cheap price. Not dollar, 50 cents. Difference. Color and 
different size, men, Hi. ladies, handkerchief. Is that your voice? No problem. Yes. Yes. 50 yes. cents. Ladies and gentlemen, come on, go in the store, look at run. Very cheap price, not buy, not problem. The store, very cheap price, everything, ladies, panties. Not color, 99, 99 cents. Black color, different colors. Latin the Latondo. 99 cents, the store, clothes, very cheap. Very, very cheap. Everything. Very cheap. Right now I'm going to show you my book. It's a very special book. It first pictures my mum in a snowstorm. And this is the place I ate lunch. There's two people on a subway. I mean, they're just talking and talking, going on and on, 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 on and on. Not talking about anything at all. And they were so close that they were one. I don't want to sleep on your lap anymore. And he's going... I forgive you, I forgive you. Down here, you see my left ventricle and my right ventricle. And these are the actual passages to my heart. Yet she can't get in there because she doesn't see the ladder. She's so blind. Blind. Yeah, she's not looking at all down no, there. No, not looking down there. And there's a lot of ball too. There's a big ball. And it's guarding, it's guarding my heart. And that, my friends, is Babbitton Day's Playhouse. That was my sketchbook. You're watching Eyeball Theater. Today's Eyeball takes a look at issues of and relating to freedom. Does being free mean not having to pay for anything? Not having to live under the control of another or not being burdened by obstructions and constraints like my footwear? Ow! Sometimes I wish I could fly, but gravity keeps me down. You see, I don't have any easy definitions of what freedom is or how you get it. But it does remind me of a problem I encountered a few months ago. I came home to find water leaking across the hallway floor, moving toward this wall. And it couldn't reach the wall because on the other side of the wall, my friend Chester's comic book collection is, and it would be destroyed. So I had to find the cause of the leak and stop it quick. Came into the bathroom, felt some moisture. The carpet itself was very moist to the touch. I could feel a little bit of moisture water leaking. Noticed the crack in the toilet and thought, oh my God, the water's coming from the crack. We've got to stop the water main somehow. And then my friend Justin walked in and he noticed that the water level in the toilet bowl was different from what it normally is. He flushed the toilet and the toilet overflowed onto the floor. Can you believe it? Sometimes the most obvious problems are the most difficult to see and they're facing you right in the eye. Hey Shane. How are you doing? I'm fine. What are you doing today? I'm drying my clothes and I'm going to go squeegee windows of cars. Oh, you're a squeegee person? Yes, I'm a squeegee person. I woke up this morning and because of the rain the past few days, my clothes are a little bit frozen solid <laughs> so I came here to dry them you're, you're thawing them out right now yeah I'm thawing them out right now yes do you feel like freer now li living on the street and washing windows and living at home yeah I do feel freer yeah to you know but I, I feel more empty well because you know you don't have your family around and stuff like that and, I don't know they just meet a lot of cold and ignorant people so then why do you choose to live on the street? Because I really don't have much of that choice right now. Oh, really? Because I'm still pretty young. I'm only 17. You don't think your parents would let you back in there? Well, my father's in jail right now, and my mom and my stepfather don't want nothing to do with me. Because I lived in a small town and caused a lot of trouble, so I kind of did it to myself. But, I don't know. It's all good. It made me grow up ten times faster, that's all. What's your goal? What's my goal? I don't really know what my goal is yet, other than, you know, to get it, get it together and you know, just have some stability in my life. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Let's go. What was that? You want to see where I live now, eh? Yeah. Alright, well, 
You just gotta go down the street here to Adelaide and spin right now. I make about five to ten bucks an hour. And um you know, but there's a lot of ignorant people out there that like to throw their two cents worth into you and you know, you get builds up over the day. And it's just different. You know, these people are out here they're telling you to get a job but you look down the street and you look at the board and the temperature says minus 15 and you're the one that's out there and they're in their cars, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly, I'm out there working and they're telling me to get a job. Yes. <laughs> Do you want to see the inside? This is our house. Shanta, you live by yourself? No, there's two of us living in this right now. So how long did it take to build? Uh, it took what? I think it was one night. So it's pretty warm? Oh yeah, it's pretty warm. Yeah. I look at this as better than what I was doing, straight up, you know, but I don't like it. You know, you like, honestly, you like it for the first little bit. It's like, oh, holy shit, it's a big party. It's fun, you know. You do this, you do that, but then once you get into it more, you see people like I was a year ago, you know, they come in first coming on and they're like, oh, it's a big party. And you, you know, you just look at them and say, no, it ain't, man, trust me, you'll find out. You assume responsibility really quick, that's all. Yeah. Made me grow up faster. I told my parents I'd learn more living six months on the street than I did going 10 years of school. Door's locked! <laughs> this job's okay, I only work here part-time. I do, I do everything here, cash, cooking, Cleaning, everything. Making the fries? Yeah, <laughs> making the fries too. It helps me to get, get a little time by and just spending money. I feel free shopping and doing um, aerobics. What's the best part of the job? Uh, best of part, I think, supervisor. <laughs> yeah. Being the boss guy? Yeah, yeah, that's the that's the best one. <laughs> no? Spare any change? No? Uh yeah. Oh, thanks. Hello? Hello? Hi. Uh, yeah, I'm here to see Charles Roach. I don't think that that, uh, that they were at this. Right now, my pet uh, freedom issue is the fact that we have to swear allegiance to a foreign monarch. In order to be a citizen, if you're not born in this country, in order to be a politician at any level at all, provincial, federal, or municipal, or any level at all, you must swear an oath to the Windsor family, mm -hmm. to Elizabeth and Charles, and uh, you see, dysfunctional family too. Yeah. Well, whether they were, even if they were angels, <laughs> you have to swear an oath to them. Not even a Canadian. These these uh, positions are maintained so that you will have a certain class of people forever because of the virtue of their blood. Subliminally, they get into your mind that that's majesty and you are inferior. They, are, they have authority and you don't have. You're subjects. Mm -hmm. and, and that is communicated, communicated to you in a million different ways. Every time you pick up a little coin, a dollar bill, you know, it's communicated to you who is the master, who is the ruler. But people don't realize that what's happening there is that this is playing tricks on your mind and you don't even think that you, you are subjugated. You think you're free, but you're not. What other things are out there beyond the monarchy that you feel sort of works in this way? Oh, many, many images. Like, you gotta be a nice, slim woman, you know, and you gotta be young in order to be beautiful. Those kinds of things make people less free because it's impacting on their minds that you can't be good, you can't be equal, you, unless you look like this. And those people who are in power are shoving these things in your minds all the time.
Do you feel like a free person? Yes, uh, you could be free if you understand what are the constraints around you that make you not free. So a person who is in jail, locked in a cell, in a dungeon, could many times be freer than some guy who's got a yacht and who's sailing on the ocean. I think Nelson Mandela was freer in his mind during the 27 years than some of those goons who were going around killing people and keeping them down. We forget that we have to liberate our minds from mental slavery. You know that song that Bob Marley sings? Emancipate yourself from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our minds. <laughs> I've been fighting for a lot of uh, rights for my people and for my children. I went to uh, to prison myself, and I spent two months in jail for something which I feel that I should have never been in jail. We was uh, on the tarmac on the ramp at the CF Goose Bay because we were fighting against military because uh, there was going to be a big NATO base in Goose Bay. It was very scary for me to go to jail, but I had to do something which I believe was very important for me because I'm fighting for my girls. I'm fighting for my grandchildren. People across Canada, they don't know how we live. Like we go in the bush and spend our time out there. To, have, to be close with our families. But when these jets are flying up so low in your tents, and besides, there's a baby in the tent, a tent, a, two, a two-year-old child. That's definitely the, the years out of a child. And it has brought traumatic experiences for my elders. And for me, as a mother, I will continue to fight. In, I won't use no weapons. I'm, I don't like weapons. What I'm going to use is my mouth. My mother was in the country. She told me when, before she died, she said, I'm leaving everything, everything up to you. It's your turn to fight. When they flooded Church of Falls in 1940, they flooded everything, all my, all my people's belongings on the ground. My parents never got no warning. And that's what gets me today. Today I can speak pretty good English, but in those days, when my parents were living, they didn't speak no word of English. That's why they couldn't, they couldn't say anything. I yes. have been in jail about four times, but the last time when they took me in, they kept me for two months. And what they done, it's, it's very hard for me to describe. Like, it brought me to tears when, when this was happening. They took me as a criminal. But for me, I, I thought to myself, I'm not a criminal. I'm just another human being who's fighting for their rights. And I wasn't ashamed to be in jail because I knew what I'd done was right. They was going to build a NATO base in Goose Bay, and they didn't. <laughs> My mom said any color but yellow. My hair is not normally this outrageous. It gets a little bad, but 
not so bad. I can do my hair up, or it's not hair, but it just points out how I like to be free. It's not so much freedom itself, like anyone can dye their hair, but it's like, it's try I'm trying to symbolize myself to point, be out of the norm. I feel like I'm caught under the downfall of my own parents and society as a whole. Everything I do, I seem I get in trouble for, and I don't get rewarded for anything that I do good. I feel freedom sometimes when I'm with my friends, but I feel like responsibility kills that freedom just as quick. I want to be responsible, but every time I want to like kick up my hair and like dance instead of just like go to school and everything. Like school's fun and everything, but sometimes you don't want to do everything by the book. My mother really worries about me, like getting into drugs and alcohol and that, but. Does she have anything to worry about? No, not really. I'm. I think I'm fairly responsible in the fact that I wouldn't go overboard on anything. So, um, I'm not like that type of person. And I just, more or less, I just like to hang out with my friends. Dog or cat, birds. I don't know. But, uh, but humans don't live like that. Yeah. They've got to make up their minds to where they're going to live and make a house and live there. The ability to do what you want to do when you want to do it. I do I feel like the the world has changed quite considerably from in the days of your youth? Yeah. It's clear. How so? More money, better bosses. Better working conditions? Yeah. I was always free. Of the, when I finished work at night, to stop at the beer parlor and have a couple of beers and smoke cigarettes. Mm -hmm. That's freedom. If you get home and whatever's there, if there's cold meat and the bread. You make a couple sandwiches for yourself and make a pot of tea. Do you feel that today is a freer society now than in your past? You go out in the daytime, it's okay, but at night time, sometimes it's risky going out at night time. But now you can hardly walk down the street. You're afraid to walk down the street in case you get clubbed. In a few years, I don't know how long it'll take, It'll be back to strict. Parents will be strict, and the kids will have to do what they're told. Kids, they're children. You don't like that word, kid? No, I don't like the word. A child's not a kid. A kid is a goat. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. You think money is freedom? Yeah. No, money is it's just paper, you know, if you don't know how, what to do with it. Freedom is the most expensive commodity and the most important. The film director, I really like uh, Luis Buñuel. One of the titles of his films is The Phantom of Liberty. The idea of the phantom of liberty, of the idea that, there, th of that, that it doesn't exist. What would one be free from? You always must be unfree from something just to exist. But of course there's different levels of it. I mean, to actually be shackled to a wall would not be very enjoyable. <laughs> I, I mean, some, some, some people, I mean, there are people that do like that, to be shackled to walls, too. So that, that, that could be considered a freedom. <laughs> Hey, how's it going? I'm at the Toronto airport and my search for freedom is going to take me halfway across the world to Singapore. But first off, I'm going to have to deal with the airplane flight. I have a fear of flying. 
Despite the eager to please service, the in-flight movies and reclining chairs, I can't shake the feeling that I'm high in the air in a large metal coffin with wings. When turbulence strikes, I imagine the airplane spiraling toward the earth and impacting on the ground in a fiery mess of twisted metal and burnt flesh. It's not like I can leave the theater. In the airplane, there's no freedom. I'm a caged animal. The flight to Singapore is 21 hours long. Singapore, hot and humid, 34 degrees, tropical like a terrarium, beautiful plants, not a tree out of place, a well-designed city with sidewalks so clean you could eat off them. It's renowned worldwide as a thriving center for commerce and industry. There are no second-hand stores, mostly shopping malls made up of high-end fashion outlets like Gucci and Versace. Everyone loves to shop. There are Chinese, Southeast Asians, Malays, Filipinos, Sri Lankans, Tamils, Europeans and North Americans who all coexist peacefully. Singapore has an exceptionally low crime rate. It's clean, safe and highly efficient. It's hard to believe 30 years ago, Singapore was like a third world country considered the opium den of Asia. Senior Minister Lee Kuan Yew from China cleaned things up with an authoritarian government. Today there are strict laws. There's a death penalty for drug trafficking, imprisonment and fines for unauthorized consumption. There's no littering, no spitting, no gum chewing, no feeding animals, no pornography, no satellite dishes, no oral sex, no walking in the nude in one's own apartment. Four people talking together about the government is considered a political gathering and is prohibited by law. There's heavy censorship. The Beatles' Sgt. Pepper's album was recently okayed, while Billy Joel's greatest hits is still banned because of a small drug reference in the lyrics. There's six TV channels, none of which broadcast a recent oil tank spill off the coast of Singapore. Telephone conversations and internet lines are monitored. One person I met said that a friend received a phone bill for a call they couldn't remember making. Upon reporting the missed billing, the telephone company sent a transcript of the conversation. Despite all the rigid laws and restrictions, prostitution is legal. And contrary to the rampant homophobia in the West, Singapore has a large mainstream gay and transvestite population. 70 to 90 percent of Singaporeans live in low-rent, government-subsidized housing development buildings. While I was in Singapore, I did not see one street person. People are extremely polite, having been raised to obey their families, the education system and the government. They're used to following orders. Although they live in an Orwellian society, Singaporeans maintain that if Big Brother is good, society is happy, and the good of the whole outweighs the interests of the individual. The few North American expatriates I met in Singapore love the country and want to stay. One person I met said that life in Singapore is easy, it's a place to turn off your mind. On my trip to Singapore, I tried interviewing people on life in the city, but everyone declined fearing that if the government found out, they would be in trouble, and that is why this entire piece has been done in a voiceover. Comparing Singapore to Canada, I'm hard pressed to say which is a better system. In Singapore, there's a high quality of life, yet less personal freedom than in Canada, where there's increasing poverty and higher crime. In Singapore, the idea of the individual, the rebel, is discouraged. Here in Canada, we look upon the individual and rebel with admiration. One thing remains universal throughout. Government, no matter where, does not take kindly to anyone who challenges the status quo. Without further ado, I would like to introduce to you, and please welcome, Dharma Gay, radical Buddhist Jewish Americanist poet, and according to his uh, poem, Multiple Identity Questionnaire, he also describes himself uh, as queer amateur S&M fan, senior citizen, sissy professor, four eyes, can't catch a baseball or drive a car, Shambhala graduate warrior, Allen Ginsberg. <laughs> Hop my heart on, harp my height, seraphs hold me steady, hip my angel, hype my light, lay it on the needy, heal the raindrop, sow the eye, bust my dust again, wool the worm, work the wise, dig my spade the same. Now I'd like to make my contribution to the war on drugs. Put down your cigarette rag. Put down your cigarette rag. Don't smoke, 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 don't smoke. It's a nine billion dollar capitalist communist joke. Don't smoke, don't smoke, don't smoke, don't smoke. How do you think, because you were part of a very, very vital community and, and very vital up until now, where do, how do you, how do we nurture a community? Well, I think there is a community already. You already got the punks and the grunge and people like, singers like Beck. 
and a lot of intelligent, uh, like uh, Adam Yauch, the, the guy, you know, who's been doing a lot of work, Beastie Boys, who've been doing a lot of work for to relieve suffering and help Tibetans and other people. So you've got a, a community, the rock community, that's somewhat mobilized politically with certain guys. Mm. Of course, the industry imposes this uh, uh, censorship, and, and it's... 50% uh, uh, is artistry, 50% is business. Well, and it's more business than artistry, let mm -hmm. me tell you. But on the other hand, you have individual geniuses like Lee Ronaldo, uh, or, um, Thurston Moore, or Beck, uh, who, who uh, actually are artists and who have some social conscience. Do the meditation, do the meditation, do the meditation, do the meditation, learn a little patience and generosity. I fought the Dharma and the Dharma won. I fought the Dharma and the Dharma won. Follow your breath out, open your eyes, sit there steady and sit there wise. Follow your breath right out of your nose, follow it out as far as it goes. It's harder to find a way to redeem and reform and cure the world's ills than it seemed to be years ago because the signals given out in the 50s and 40s and 60s by the avant-garde were not heeded by the governments and the people. Ecological signals, signals for gay liberation, signals for uh, uh, preserving the indigenous peoples of the world, signals uh, about uh, cutting down the forest, raping Africa for whatever they could get of raw materials at cheap, in, in uh, sort of stealing uh, to sustain the comfort of the Western nations and the high standard of living for Canadians and Americans and Western Europeans at the expense of the pain and the labor of underdeveloped nations who were kept underdeveloped by the colonial system and the post-colonial economics. So it seems harder to get out of the planetary fix than it did before 60, the 60s when they were some hope that people would have some common sense. A lot of people, young people, are feeling kind of like out of it. Like they look at other places, other time periods, the beats or the hippies are presented to us through these rose-colored glasses and they feel, you know, we're sort of products of a shortened attention span, channel flipping culture, and they don't know where to begin. You started a community for yourself with your friends and stuff. How would you suggest to not, I'm where not even talking, yeah, I'm not even talking about begin? back and stuff. Where's the question is where to begin? Yeah. To begin with your own feeling, with recognition of your own feeling, your own grief, uh, your own affections, uh, and binding yourself with your friends, bonding with friends who have the same affections in uh, setting yourself off on a journey to relieve your own suffering and the suffering of your friends and the suffering of others outside that you don't know. The whole point is to diminish the mass of human suffering. And that's where you begin, and that's applicable at any moment, at any time, i.e., you don't kick the cat on your way out of the house. You don't insult your mother. You don't insult your girlfriend. You have to stop your own suffering as well. Right, so you don't insult yourself to begin with. So it's mainly the orientation to acknowledging your own feeling and your own longing and your own desire. So you start with your own heart, your own desire, your own empathy, mm -hmm. your own sympathies. Mm -hmm. And then you work things out practically from there. Mm -hmm. Now they say that's impractical. But uh, what's really impractical is this continuation of alienated affections and uh, the raising of the planet and the exploitation of people and the feeling of solitude and paranoia.